Well, hello and welcome, folks. My name is Celeste Harrison, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's Explorer Classroom uh, with Katie Croft Bell. We're extra excited to have her here today because it is Ocean Week on Explorer Classroom. And we've got tons and tons of events celebrating our wonderful ocean. Uh, and there's really no one better than Katie to do that for us. Uh, so today we're joined by classrooms from New Jersey and Guelph and Virginia and Texas and Ontario and Missouri, like just all over North America, people are coming together to celebrate our ocean, which is great because this Friday is here with you today and right now we're going to screen share so you might see another version of Celeste in just a moment and well <laughs> there you go uh, switch it over to a little presentation so I like to try to keep these interactive so if it's possible to maybe turn on a, um, a classroom or two at the opposite oh, moment excellent so the ocean, it is amazing, it's huge, it covers almost three quarters of our planet and holds most of the life on Earth. But despite the fact that you see this globe spinning around and it looks like we know everything there is to know about the bottom of the ocean, it's not actually true. There's still so, so much to explore and we're not gonna do it in my lifetime, certainly. So I'm really excited about all of the classrooms and students who are tuning in right now because hopefully you will be ocean explorers when you grow up or even now. But why should we explore the ocean? Can we turn on a classroom or two to maybe answer that question? Sure, let's go to Miss Grimshaw's classroom. What are, the, all right, what are the things we might wanna know about the ocean? I'm sorry, there was an announcement going off. I missed your question. So why should we explore the ocean? Why what are some of the things we might want to know? Dublin? Because we can find lots of interesting animals. We can find lots of interesting animals. Absolutely, what else? Krish? Interesting plants? Yes. There's more that you can explore. There's more to explore than we already know. Yelp, Abby? Like, um, you can find some creatures mixed together. Maybe. Like some land yeah. creatures mixed together. Yeah, they're living together, right? They're sharing the same habitat. Amanda? To go all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if that's possible, right, Adam? Um, explore new places. New places. Absolutely. Great answers. So yeah, and actually there are a few more. So we love to play in the ocean. We love to surf and swim and dive. And so it's really important for all of those reasons, but also for people. So it's really important for us to be able to get food from fish and, and other things that are living in the ocean um, and also to interact with it. So you have fishing boats out there, you have um, marine plants. So some of them are big and some of them are teeny tiny and marine plants are really important because they provide a lot more than half of the air we breathe. Also offshore energy. So you have windmills offshore, but also oil and gas and beaches protect us from storms. So I don't know if we have any um, Florida or other coastal classrooms on the line right now, but being able to protect our barrier beaches are really important to be able to protect us from storms or high tides. So what do we wanna learn? Well, this is what we just talked about. So what is in the water? So the chemistry of the water. So is it hot, is it cold, is it salty, is it not salty? And all of those differences in ocean chemistry drive the way the water moves around the world. It's like a big conveyor belt. So the cold, cold waters up in the north and way down in the south in the Arctic and the Antarctic get really heavy and they sink down to the bottom of the ocean and then push the other water out of the way. So you have these big currents that drive the movement of heat and um, nutrients or food for plants and animals all over the world. And that's really important. 
um, particularly for what lives in the ocean. So we heard a lot about what kind of animals live down there and who lives together. Um, so all of the, the ocean chemistry really um, has a big impact on what lives there and also how the earth works. So you've probably heard about volcanoes on land, on Hawaii and a recent eruption um, in Guatemala, but most of the volcanoes on our planet are actually underwater and we haven't explored most of them because they're pretty hard to get to. Um, and also who uses the ocean? So the ocean is obviously very important for fish and other animals, but it's also really important for us. And people have been sailing on the ocean and the seas for thousands and thousands of years. So sometimes we find ancient shipwrecks that can tell us about that kind of movement and trade and communication between the different people that, um, that live on the water and use it for being able to transport goods. Um, the you know TVs and computers that you get from China, they all come over um, the ocean. They don't go on planes. A lot of the, um, the trade that goes on all over the world from ancient times like this ancient Roman shipwreck that you see um, up to today. So what are the challenges? Why is it hard to study the ocean and why don't we know everything about it yet? Can we talk to another classroom? Absolutely. Have any ideas? Let's go to the Waterhouse classroom and turn your microphone on. Let's see. Yes. Oops, wrong one. Brilliant. Yeah, what are your ideas, guys? Call them out. Tell us, why is it hard? Let me grab a new classroom. All right. You know what? Let me put that mic again. There you go. You're unmuted. Go for it. Hi, everybody. What are some of the challenges? Jaden? That um, the challenges are that you don't know where other animals are. You're just like, ooh, I can't wait to see new animals. But <laughs> when, when you see them, you see, you've seen them before. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. What else? And yeah, the water gets polluted. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. Absolutely, that's definitely a challenge. Mateo? Um, most fish in the sea can't survive in their harsh environment from the polluted water. What makes the environments harsh? Like boats, for example. Excellent. What about if you go down deep in a swimming pool, if you're swimming, what does it do to your ears? Can Amber? you feel that? It hurts, yeah. your, it hurts your ears really bad. Yeah. So what, what do you think might happen if you go really, really deep in the ocean, deeper than a swimming pool? It hurts. It hurts. Very bad. Yeah. So the weight of the water on top of you creates a lot of pressure. And so that may, that's a big, big challenge for either putting people on the water or putting robots in the water. What other things might make it a difficult to explore the ocean? Um, so like, um, when you like go in the ocean, it's like hard, it's like hard to um, like keep, like, because you don't know if there's like any animal that can attack you when you're not looking. Yeah, it's hard when we go to new places because we don't know what we're going to find or if we're going to find anything. So some of the other things that make it challenging are that it's wet. The water is wet. Places are far away. It's dark way down in the bottom of the ocean. It's deep, so you have a lot of pressure. There's no air. Um, it's salty, and it, that makes working with um, equipment, machinery, robots, really, um, really difficult because things get rusty, right? It can be super cold. The bottom of the ocean is close to freezing. And sometimes it can be super hot, like near volcanoes. So you have all sorts of extremes. Like I think one of the answers was about harsh environments. So yeah, absolutely. All of these things make it really, really challenging um, to explore the ocean. You can't just like swim to the bottom of the pool, it's super deep and there's a lot of pressure and it's cold and salty. So you need specialized tools to be able to explore the ocean. So how about another classroom might have some ideas about how we explore the ocean? 
Sure, let's jump to Ontario. Turn your microphone. Go for it. Okay. Uh, we're in Leamington, Ontario. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, let's hear. Hey, yeah what are your ideas? All right, Devin. Um, well, do you take care like the of the animals? Being taking care of the animals. Can you repeat that? You're kind of quiet. Yeah, say it loud. It's on. Well, you look around like, and you help the coral or the fish. Really, looking around at, at the environments around you, what might you use to look around? What do you use to look around? Okay, Jordan. Quickly, Jordan. Boats, um, dignity, any um, vehicle that can go on water. Yep, absolutely. Boats and underwater vehicles. Okay, quick, over here. How else would I be explore the ocean? A scuba diving outfit. Yeah, absolutely. Jaden, come on over, quick. No. No, right. Goggles. Sorry, didn't hear you. Goggles. Goggles? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely need goggles if you go in the water. And the scuba diving, yeah, those are all in the same vein. So people can go in the water. Um, also satellites. So even though they're way up above the earth, there are a lot of different kinds of sensors on satellites that can study different aspects of the ocean from the sea surface temperature to the marine plants that are at the surface to the shape of the seafloor. Scuba diving, we heard, um, and you can definitely do that in the shallower waters of the ocean. And a lot of people do use scuba to explore particularly uh, coral reefs and other interesting shallow areas. Um, but to go deeper, you can't use scuba equipment. You need to go in a submersible. So human-occupied vehicles like this one, it's called Alvin, um, can go to very, very deep in the ocean. So to bring people, only three people can fit in Alvin. So you usually have a pilot and a couple of scientists who might go down and study the deep sea. You can also use autonomous underwater vehicles. These are underwater robots that you um, tell it what to do before you launch it, and then you drop it over the side of the boat, or you launch it with a big, um, big heavy equipment, an A-frame or a crane, and you drop it in the water, and it goes and, and does a survey, and then hopefully it comes back to you, and then you can get the data from it and, and see the area that the robot explored. Um, and boats, we heard too. So boats are really important to go, particularly out into the deep sea uh, far away from shore. And this is the exploration vessel Nautilus. So this is a ship that I um, sailed on for many years with the Ocean Exploration Trust. And on board, we had uh, a multi-beam sonar. So this is a big, big piece of equipment on the bottom of the ship that would send pings of sound. So it'd go ping, ping. And that sound would go down to the bottom, bounce off the seafloor, and come back up. And then you measure it's just like a bat or a dolphin navigates. They send out the little pulse of sound and it comes back and then you can figure out um, what the shape of the seafloor is like. And so that's what we use to make um, maps of an area when we go somewhere new. And then we put in uh, remotely operated vehicles. So this is another kind of robot that is tethered to the ship. So there's a big long cable that can go down 12,000 feet in the ocean. And these vehicles have arms and hands so that you can collect samples like biological samples um, or rocks or cores of the sediment or the sand at the bottom of the ocean um, and also cameras so we can see what we're looking at and lights again because it's dark down there. 
Um, there are also smaller ROVs. So the one that you saw previously, Hercules, um, is very big and you need a special boat and heavy equipment to be able to launch and recover it and a big team of people to operate it. But there are also other smaller vehicles. This one is from a group called Open ROV, and this is their Trident vehicle. And one person can do this. It's really small. You can drop it over the side and practically control it with your phone. So there are all sorts of different ways of exploring the ocean. So what kinds of things do we find? Uh, what do you think? What do you Let's think? go to Let's go well, Let's head to Westminster Woods. Let me turn your Whoa. microphone on. Thank you, sir. What hey, we guys. Yeah, Bella, what do you think? Come on up. What was the question? Um, what do you think we'd find? You may find rocks and samples of things underwater. Yes, absolutely. We find lots of rocks. Well, come on up. You can find different sorts of sea creatures like sharks and different types of fish. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You might find a new species. We might find a new species, yes. Mm -hmm. You might find sunken ships. Sun sunken ships? Sunken ships, yeah. Yeah. Aisha, come on up. We have two more. Go ahead. Um, you like you can find sunken sunken ships, but it can also tell you history about what happened well, with the know. boats and stuff that sank. Yeah, yeah. So this not just the ships themselves, but what are the stories of them? Absolutely. Do we have time for one more? Sure, one more, and then I can show you some highlights of some of the things that we found. Um, what materials did you, um, just to share what we might find in the ocean? Oh, um, have you found any, um, emeralds or, um, diamonds in the ocean before? Um, I have not, but places like certain kinds of underwater volcanoes and hydrothermal vents have, uh, gold and silver and other precious metals, for sure, which is really important for, um, you know, being able to find those kinds of resources, geological resources. And on seamounts, so underwater mountains out in the middle, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, you find what are called rare earth elements. And those are really important for a lot of the components in computers and smartphones. Um, so being able to understand what those resources are and, and how we might use them or how we might protect those areas from mining is really important. Great answers, guys. So I'm going to share with you a few of the things that we found around the world, and then we can go to questions. So some of the things we found with Nautilus are we heard about shipwrecks. So this is an ancient shipwreck. It's about 1,500 years old that we found off the coast of Turkey. And we actually spent a lot of time in the Mediterranean and the Aegean seas looking for shipwrecks because uh, people have been living there for, for thousands and thousands of years. and using the sea and using boats to transport um, wine and oil and fish and other goods um, from place to place was really the primary way that people transported things. So this, what you're looking at is all of these little jars would have been carrying something from one port to another, and it might've been oil or wine or fish sauce. Um, we didn't collect any artifacts from it, um, but we did find at least two dozen shipwrecks off the coast of Turkey um, when we were there just a few years ago. So this is an underwater volcano in Greece, so in the Aegean Sea, um, near Santorini, which is a much larger volcano that erupted about 3,600 years ago and caused all sorts of um, problems for people in the Eastern Mediterranean, but this one is called Colombo. It's nearby to Santorini and it's completely underwater. Um, so what you're seeing right now are hydrothermal vents. And this is, these are the kind of vents where you, you find those kinds of precious metals like gold um, in pretty high concentrations. So all these bubbles that are coming out of the seafloor, they're very rich in carbon dioxide. So the magma that's down below the seafloor 
is heating up water and, and giving it lots and lots of carbon dioxide. So those are all the bubbles that you come coming up. And because of the carbon dioxide, it's making the water really acidic. So things like vinegar are very acidic and animals can't really live in very acidic water. So that's why all you see are the, um, those orangey and brown streaks of bacteria and microbes because there are no fish. Now, this was a really fun discovery. We were actually looking for an underwater volcano off the coast of Italy, um, Sicily, actually, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And we came across this. Anybody have a guess as to what it is? Let's go to our last very patient classroom for some. All right. Your library. What go. do you think this is? We can't, I can't hear him, but it sounds like somebody's trying to talk. Yeah, would you, would you speak just a little louder and closer to the computer for us? Um, I can't. Maybe a teacher can relay the question. We're having a lot of difficulty. All right, not to fear. There's also a chat bar. Or you can email me and I'll relay those suggestions and questions later on. But we just can't quite hear you. So let's jump back to the Grimshaw classroom. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. You guys have a question? What do you think we have here? We're looking for an underwater okay. volcano that we found. Walk up, uh, Sarah, walk up and tell us what you think it was. The speaker's over here. What do you think it is, Sarah? A broken shipwreck? Close. It's not a ship, but Close. it's definitely That's something to Tell them, tell them what you think your guess is. A plane. A bit louder. A plane. A plane? Yeah. Yes, it's a plane. <laughs> well done. So, yeah, we were off the coast of Italy, and while while we're exploring, we also have a live feed from the bottom of the ocean. So we didn't know what we were looking at, and it um, it looked like a plane. So we thought that, but there were actually people in Sicily who were tuning in and watching a live stream, and they told us that it's probably an airplane from World War II that got shut down in a battle with uh, with the British, the Battle of Pantelleria. Um, so it was very exciting to. You know, it's always exciting to find something new, but. Quite exciting to find such a, an important piece of history down on the bottom of the ocean because um, you never know when you're looking for a volcano you might find a plane. So this one is a little closer to home. This is in the Gulf of Mexico um, just off the coast of Mississippi, Louisiana, that kind of area where the oil spill happened just a few years ago, eight years ago, so some of you might not have been born yet, but there was a, a big, big oil spill, and there's a group of scientists that have been coming back to the same sites and looking at the impact of the oil on the corals and the other animals that live on the seafloor here. So you see these little brittle stars and corals, and the, the yellow things are actually hydroids, which are different animals that live on corals that aren't doing very well. Um, and there's an octopus, of course. This one is also in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a shipwreck that was found just a few years ago. And we went back to collect some samples from it so that the archeological team, the archeologists could study what it was. And it seems as though, so if you can see there are two little red dots in the middle of the screen sometimes, those help us measure the, the sizes of, of things that are down on the bottom. So those are 10 centimeters apart, or about four and a half inches. And so you can see the jars and bottles and, and all sorts of things that were on this um, shipwreck. This is Hercules picking up a jar. And we didn't know what was in it at first, but it turns out it was full of ginger, which is a, a common remedy for seasickness. So even people a couple hundred years ago got seasick <laughs> when they were <laughs> sailing in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, here's an anchor. Um, and being able to collect those artifacts starts to tell us the story of, of this site and why, um, what it was doing there and, and what might have happened to it. And so we think that this was potentially a privateer or almost like a pirate ship that was actually 
um, bringing a couple of other ships that, that were found nearby to what is now Texas. Texas wasn't a state at the time. And they there were three shipwrecks that all sank within very close um, proximity to each other and all seem to be from the same time period. So they think that um, all of these wrecks got sunk in a big storm in the Gulf of Mexico all together. And the last one here, this is also from the Gulf of Mexico. This science team was planning on collecting some water samples and bubble samples from the ocean, and this was another surprise discovery. Zoom out, look around, rotate. I'm going to turn the M3 off, guys. He's got a bump here. No, it's possible. No, it's possible. Okay. Zoom out on wow. So you see that big awesome. sperm whale oh, wow. <laughs> checking out Hercules. Yes, it's recording. Yeah. And these, ro these robots are quite loud when they go down in the water. So if you had asked me if we ever see whales or other um, marine mammals, I would have said no because the robots are too way too noisy. But this sperm whale was super curious and ended up swimming around the vehicles for a good long while trying to figure out what we were and what we were doing there. He's just doing laps. Open up. So those are just a few of the things that we find while we're out exploring. That is amazing. <laughs> Isn't it? It's incredible. Yeah, and it certainly prompts a lot of questions. So classrooms on screen, get those questions ready. We're about to circle through you, but we had an anxious viewer, um, Mr. Chris's second grade class. They're in Canton, Michigan. They would like to know what the very coolest creature you've ever encountered is. Ever? That's a tough question because practically every time we go out and explore, we find another cool creature. But one of my favorites is a Dumbo octopus. Uh, really just because they're super cute and I really like them. <laughs> That's so a... They're not that common, so it's always really exciting when we do find one. All right, Canton, Michigan, go ahead and Google those Dumbo octopuses. Yeah, check out Dumbo octopus. And for now, let's go to the Waterhouse classroom. What are your questions for Katie? I'm going to turn your microphone on. There we go. Hi. 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 How long um, have you been exploring the ocean, and when were you ready to explore the ocean? Ah, excellent. So the first time, well, I grew up near the beach, so I grew up in San Diego, California, and I loved just going to the beach and swimming, and so all growing up. I just loved being on the water. Um, but I didn't go on my first expedition until I was in college. I was studying engineering and I had an opportunity to go on a trip to the Black Sea to look for shipwrecks. And that was my first expedition and it was almost 20 years ago now, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, but that was my first time and it was so exciting. I was absolutely hooked and I knew that I wanted to do ocean exploration for the rest of my life. That's awesome. Do we have one more question from that same classroom before we move somewhere else? Mackenzie? Um, We've got lots more than one. How many animals have you found? Oh, I don't know if I can even count how many animals we found. Um, <laughs> we find different animals everywhere we go, and you know, it depends on um, the places we go from underwater volcanoes to coral reefs to deep coral reefs, everything is different all over the world. And so I don't think it's possible to know how many animals because there are just so many. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> jump to Leamington, I'm gonna turn on your microphone. Do you have a couple quick questions for Katie? Oh. 
How does a bone well go so deep? How does a what go so deep? Blue whale. Ah. <laughs> the whale? Yeah, that was a sperm whale. And I'm not a whale expert, so I don't know all the details, but I think that that whale was at a few hundred meters or so, which is not uncommon for them. Um, whales, as you might know, have to breathe air just like we do so they have to come to the surface and breathe through the blowhole and then they hold their breath and then they're able to dive really really deep and be able to catch food and apparently check out robots occasionally <laughs> just yesterday we talked to asha debose who's a sri lankan whale expert oh, uh, yeah. so you can check out that explorer classroom about 15 minutes in she talks about the diving of the whales it's great she also spends a lot of time discussing whale poop so oh, yeah, whale experts whale poop a lot, but yeah, whales have some amazing adaptations for being able to dive way deep in the water that you know we just can't do. So it's really incredible that they're able to do that. Leamington, do you have another question ready? Go ahead, Lacey. Hi, my name is Lacey, and why did you think you picked that job? What did I think? Can you repeat the question? Why did you pick your job? Why did I pick my job? Well, it's really, I think, because I grew up just loving the water. And I grew up on a swim team. And in high school, I sailed and tried to learn how to surf, but I wasn't very good at that. Um, I also learned how to scuba dive when I was in high school, which was really exciting. And so when I went off to college, I, like, in school, really loved math and I really loved science. So I knew that I wanted to do something like engineering or science, but I didn't know what, what kind. Um, and then I found out that ocean engineering existed. So that kind of blended my love of the ocean with the things that I was really good at. And it worked out really, really well for me. So, you know, as you guys are studying in school and thinking about what you might want to do in the future, really think about what you like doing and what you're good at doing and, you know, trying to figure out how, how those things might intersect. Awesome. Let's yeah. jump to Westminster Woods in Guelph. Do you guys have some questions? Yeah, we make a lot of No, we don't. We don't have any questions. Yes. I bet you do somewhere. I see a lot of hands. Go for it. Let me call one out. Sorry, go ahead, Liam. Um, have you ever found a new type of fish, like a new fish, a new species? Um, I don't know if I found a new type of fish, but there are definitely lots of new species that we find all the time. Um, on one of the expo and oftentimes we don't know we found a new species until we've collected one and brought it back to the lab to do um, some analysis on it. So um, I actually just found out that on an expedition about two years ago, that we found two or three new species of sponge off the coast of California in Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So yeah, we find new things all the time, particularly when ships go to places that have never been explored before. It's very, very common to find new species and not always fish. It might be a coral or a sponge or, or other things as well. Great question. Great. Do we have another? Yes, we do. Have you ever had a malfunction with one of your technologies? Ah, fantastic question. We have malfunctions all the time. Uh, <laughs> they're very, very complex systems that we're using, the robots that we're using, and all the computers that are needed to keep them running, um, all the sensors that are on them, um, as well as the communications. So we have the satellite on board the ship and that's got to be running all the time so it's actually incredible how much we can keep running um 24 hours a day compared to how much downtime there is but yeah they're very very complex systems so we have always have to have an amazing team of engineers on board who are able to not just drive the robots but also maintain them so they're constantly making sure that everything is working and fixing things that are broken and we try to just be in the water as much as we can great question Let's swing back through that last school. I know you had mic troubles last time, but let's all cross our fingers. All right, your microphone is on. Would you give us a question if you can? I believe in you. 
You can do it. All right, that's fine. We're not able to hear you. Um, while you're watching on YouTube, if you minimize it from full screen, off to the side there's a chat bar. That's where I got that question from the second grade class. Leave me your questions there or in the in Hangout chat and I'll ask them for you. Um, but for now we have another question from the chat bar. Katie, they're wondering where you're at today and you're somewhere pretty cool. You want to talk about that for a second? I am. I'm actually at the Explorers Club in New York City right now. and. Unfortunately, I was I was planning on getting here early to be in a room which has lots of cool stuff on the walls from explorers from all over the world, but I'm much better at navigating a ship than I am the New York subway. So I got here a little bit late and ended up in somebody's office. So you can see like a window and an air conditioner, which is not that exciting, but <laughs> maybe next time I'll be able to get here a little sooner. Right. <laughs> Um, and classrooms on screen, would you give me a great big wave if you have another question? That'll be my cue to come by. And All right, well, there's a bunch of great lots big of, waves. Lots of questions. Let's go here. Give me one second to turn your microphone on. Let's rock and roll. What's your question, Waterhouse class? <clears throat> what kind of new animals have you discovered this year? This year, well, I just discovered that from um, that expedition a couple years ago, um, we found the new sponges. So that is super exciting. I haven't been out exploring yet this year. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully, I'll be going to a country called Trinidad, which is on the northeast side of South America in August. And we're going to be bringing little remotely operated vehicles, uh, one of those Trident ROVs as well as a drop camera from National Geographic. So this is a big camera that can go super deep down in the water. And we'll be bringing those down to Trinidad in August. So nothing yet, no expeditions yet, but soon enough. And hopefully we'll be able to share some of the results with you and tell you what we found. I see someone waiting really patiently at Westminster Woods. So I'm gonna turn your microphone on, go for it. What's your question? She went twice. <laughs> I was wondering how many different species of whales have you seen? Um, with the robots, really just the one, just that sperm whale. Oftentimes um, the robots are really, really loud and they have really bright lights. So sometimes they scare animals away. Um, so we're actually quite surprised to see that one at all. <laughs> but people use all sorts of other kinds of ways to study whales. Um, there are a lot of people that scuba dive to photograph and study whales. Um, Asha scoops up whale poop um, to study what the whales eat and how healthy they are. And you can also put um, cameras on whales to see where they're going and how they're behaving. And there's all sorts of cool like critter cam videos that I'm sure you can find online if you want to check out some of that. But that's not what I've done, but there are definitely resources if you want to learn more about studying whales. Brilliant. And Katie, do you have any parting wisdom or calls to action for our classrooms today? Well, I want you all to get out and explore the water around you. Be you in the Great Lakes or in an ocean or near a river, get outside and just see what you might find because you never know, it could be super exciting. Brilliant. And there's no better week than this week. Again, Friday is World Ocean Day. Super exciting. Tune into as many of our events as you can. Enjoy the ocean. Celebrate our ocean. Protect our ocean. Um, and be sure to like and subscribe and visit naturaled.org backslash explore classroom to register your own classroom for one of these on-screen spaces with an explorer. Let's give a great big thank you to Katie. Uh, for being with us today, I'm going to turn on all the classroom microphones. Everybody's Thank you all for tuning in. Bye, guys. <laughs>